Moon, my beautiful babes and babes. I'm your resident active advocate, and I'm sorry this is kind of late. I've been writing in the morning, working in the afternoon, had to eat, and then I was feeling like a lazy bum. So, that's why this is later than usual. But anyway, today I would like to talk to you about how to avoid slash undo the damage that can be done by the different sorts of infantilization I've been talking about. This is going to be a multi-part series within the series that I'm doing here because there's not just one element or one aspect to any of these models of infantilization. In the case of basically all of them, there is the one who gives it and the one who receives it. And on both ends of this spectrum, the damage needs to be either avoided or undone. So when it comes, firstly, to loving infantilization, I would like to talk first about the giver. I'm going to talk about that today. And then tomorrow I will talk about the recipient and so on and so forth through the other kinds I have discussed with you. All right, so for loving infantilization, you may be a parent, a caretaker, an authority figure in the life of someone with a disability and that person is in your charge or in your care. Right. So let's just use as an example the mother of a person with a disability. I find that often when it comes to the parental role, no matter who your child is, you want what is best for them, right? So I'm only using the mother as an example, but you can put literally anyone in this role if they have the person's best interest in mind. And when it comes to loving infantilization, they do have the person's best interests in mind, but they don't know how to go about keeping those interests at the forefront and making sure that the person with the disability can also take care of their own interests. That's the important part here. But so when it comes to this kind of infantilization, one of the motivating factors, of course, is that you will want to keep the person in your care safe. Safe from accidents, safe from social judgment, which you may think will always be negative. Because society, you look at society and how consistently throughout history, society has viewed people with disabilities. Quote, they see, quote, us as a, quote, negative, right? And when you go into any kind of relationship with that assumption in mind, you are going to act upon that assumption. When you are raising a child with a disability, therefore, you're going to want to protect them to the best of your ability, of course. And that is completely understandable. It comes from a place of love. It comes from a place of kindness and of generosity, but it also comes from a place of fear. Love and fear are not mutually exclusive. You can love someone and fear for them at the same time, of course. And you may fear for someone because you love them. The whole idea here is that you want to keep them safe from what could happen to them later on. But there's a line I heard in a video done by Cinema Therapy. If you don't know who they are, you should check them out on YouTube. The whole idea of, I promise I will never let anything happen to you. But then the therapist guy in this duo says, but then nothing will ever happen to you. And you see the nuance there. You see that in this drive to protect the person in our charge, we may keep them back from reaching their whole potential. And we may do so under the assumption that this is what is best for them. They may not be able to protect themselves. Society sure as hell isn't going to protect them. They're going to just you know, write them off or beat them up or bully them or, you know, all these different 
bad outcomes that could come of society's judgment of a person with a disability. However, if you are a person of this kind of persuasion, bear in mind the fact that a person's treatment is often based on what that person is demonstrably capable of doing. If I were in your position, and I'm not, but if I were, I would advise you instead to still act in a loving and protective manner, right? Because that's your, that's one of your jobs as a parent or as a caretaker. And that's one of the defining properties of a parent or a caretaker. But in order to fully ensure that the person in your care has the capacity to do what they, I don't want to use destiny or anything like that, but what they have the capability of doing. You don't know what they have the capability of doing unless you allow them to go into that mindset of their own and to decide for themselves what their capabilities are and to decide for themselves what their limitations are. Unfortunately, and this is this is the best analogy, but unfortunately, sometimes the kid has to get burned by putting their hand on the stove and realize that, okay, stove hot, you know, don't touch stove. And we often learn lessons like these when we are very, very young. But in the case of people with disabilities, that age quote limit can, you know, go up and up and up and up, depending on how fearful the caretaker is of this person getting hurt or of this person being negatively judged and all these negative outcomes that we expect through our own fear. It's a matter of letting go of your own fear as well. <clears throat> a secondary aspect of this, however, is a little more insidious and I have seen this in action. A caretaker will sometimes define their own identity and their own sense of worth by what they bring into the life of the person with the disability. However, if they loosen the chains, quotation marks, I beg your pardon. If they loosen the chains, quotation marks, and give up control willingly and give up that role willingly, what is left for the caretaker? That can be an in very insidious problem. And as I say, I have seen this in action. When the bird has left the nest, where do you go? And that, I think, is a matter of figuring out who you are as well, separate from this individual who may need your care and who may need your attention. That is something that is completely 100% on you and also on your own social network. Make sure that you do not define your own life by this one role you possess, because to do so is to master status yourself. And yes, I am using that as a verb again. If you see yourself as this person's only go-to, and if you see this as the thing that you must do, you are compelled to do this. This is the, your raison d'etre, your reason to be, right? That's not healthy for you either. It's no healthier for you than it is for the person in your charge. And both of you need to let go of that rope that binds you together. It's the same as with any other child. It really is. If you see, let's say they're your child, if you see them as, quote, normal and capable, if you see them as you would see any other child, then it will be easier for you to let go. I do not advocate overdoing it. I'm not going to say you need to let go at this point in their life, like the instant they turn 13 or whatever it is. As with any other process in life, this is going to be a process. It is going to be gradual. But allow them to grow away from you, to grow into their own individual human being when they are ready to do so, when they are capable of doing so. 
I'm not saying let them run out into the road and get hit by a car. You know, that's that's not what I'm saying here. It's the same as raising any other child. You do keep them safe. You do keep them nurtured and loved and make sure they're loved. But to give independence is also to give love. If you cling to your child, if you cling to your role, it's not healthy for you either, as I have said. So as a parent, as a caretaker, you need to define yourself in more than one way. You're not just this person's parent. You're not just this person's caretaker. You're also, you know, everything else about you. You've got your own interests and you've got your own skills. Don't let those go by the wayside in the name of defending this person much as you love them, right? You know, birds need to exercise their wings. If the wings atrophy, the bird's not going to be able to fly. And that's really bad for both parties involved or for all parties involved. So that is my video for the side of the giver of care of the loving infantilization. I beg your pardon once again from my phone, but I was not going to stop this video in order to get the phone. So I was already too far in, sorry. All right, I will see you tomorrow to talk about the other half of this equation, the person who has been infantilized and how to lovingly and kindly and gently go about gaining your freedom, shall we say, because this side of it can be very involved. All right, I will see y'all tomorrow. Have a lovely rest of the afternoon. Mwah.